Hello and welcome to lesson 15.2 where we're going to expand our understanding of double integrals and calculate them over generally shaped regions and not merely rectangular regions. So here we go. I have a new format here and it's still a little clunky. Okay. I don't have my mouse attached. All right. So I'm using the trackpad here. Um, but I'm just going to briefly mention to you, this is almost completely identical to the derivation from 15.1. So I just kind of summarized it. I'm going to mention it very quickly. The difference between the, uh, the other lesson and this one is that when we are looking at our region of integration, which is the blue kind of egg shape here, um, you'll notice we don't have boundaries parallel to the x and y axis anymore for the outer edges of the boundaries. But we're still going to partition the shape with rectangles, and we're still going to have the rectangles oriented um, where the sides are parallel with the axes so that we can call the length of one side delta x and the length of the other side delta y, and therefore the area is delta x times delta y. Area is for one little rectangle. So we have n rectangles in this region. And notice how they did not fill in um, with this beige color partial rectangles. They left those blue, and so we don't want to pick rectangles that stick out past the edges of the boundaries. Um, now, as the number of rectangles increases to infinity, we'll reduce the size of each rectangle to get smaller and smaller and smaller, so that we reduce the error that's found in these blue margins around the edge um, to infinitesimally small little rectangles, dx, dy, and uh, once again we have this Riemann sum which is the area times the height of each uh, rectangular column, and we add all those areas up to get our Riemannian sum. And then as we take the limit as n goes to infinity, we get the double integral over the region R of f of x times dA. So that is once again the derivation of what we're doing. Um, so this looks a little different, okay, because the difficulty and the, and the main difference between this and what we did in 15.1 is that we just don't have pretty constant limits um, in both directions, okay. So we can integrate with respect to y first or with respect to x first, and I need you to understand what that means. So here's a good picture from the book that shows you our uh, z equals f of xy is this surface on top that's not flat. Um, you could do a flat surface if you wanted to, but it would be easier just to do volume of a cube or, or a rectangular prism. Um, so this covers a curved surface up here. And then notice that we've got, got a curved edge down here where it says y equals g2 of x. On the back side, that's a curved edge of a region R um, with boundary y equals g1x. So those are the boundaries that we are describing um, on these two sides. Now the other two sides, the boundaries are constants from A to B. Notice that. So we're going to take this cross section of this shape and we're going to slide that down. Okay, we'll start at one end and we'll slide it down all the way across from A to B. So this is an area and we slide it across the shape from A to B. That represents the volume of the whole shape. and um, we got to do this in two pieces. So a of x is the area of this shape, which will be um, the height of the shape, so a, a value on top up here, times little bitty changes in y. Okay. So as we go from y equals this function to y equals this function, that's across here, and then we multiply it by function values, which gives us heights. So this is an area, so we integrate with respect to y, so moving from one y function to the other uh, function, and that's y equals, okay? We get an area here, and then when we put the area into an uh, integral, and then secondly integrate with respect to x, moving this cross section from one end of the shape to the other from A to B, that's what these limits do represent constants, then that turns it into volume. So we have our interior iterated integral here that we do this integral first, 
and we evaluate it and we plug in function, uh, functions for the limits, which means that we'll still have a function inside here when we're done most likely. And then we can do the integration with respect to y. So first we're thinking about taking a cross section and sliding, um, or excuse me, and, and, ca and calculating area as we travel along the direction of the x-axis and then, or of the y-axis, excuse me, so with respect to y first, and then we'll take that cross section and move it in the x direction and integrate with respect to the change in x. Okay, so always read dy and dx as change in y and change in x. So first we move from one function y to the other function y, and that was function to function instead of constant to constant. Then we can put that inside another integral and integrate with respect to the change in x. So the other way to do it is very, very similar. We simply change the order. Oh, it is not giving me my next slide. Okay. Hmm, did it just consider that a... All right, I'm going to pause while I fix this. Okay, problem fixed. So we're going to change the order of integration now, and we're going to integrate with respect to x first, which means that's the inside integral. So now we have a region, and here is our function uh, z equals f of xy, which gives us the top surface. And now we're going to go um, with respect to y, we're going to be traveling um, to from one function of y, see how this is x equals h2 of y, and this one is x equals h1 of y. We're going to travel from one side to the other in the x direction as x goes from h1 to h2, both functions of y. That's our inside integral that gives us the area of this cross section right here. And then we're going to start, we're going to slide this cross section from C down to D in the Y direction. So that would be changing Y. DY is the change in Y. So we'll be traveling from C to D in the Y direction, always in the increasing order. So C is implied to be lower than D. So we need proper definite integrals, not improper, with the lower limit always on the bottom. And you can tell for constants, it's easy to tell which is lower. But when it comes to functions, you have to judge which one you're going to hit first in increasing order. So when we did the, the inside one, increasing order on the x-axis is starting at zero and moving this direction. So we're going to use this function as our lower limit and this function as our upper limit because this one is farther along the y-axis and therefore a, quote, greater value on x. All right, so now we need to see this in action. Um, Blessedly, this is another short section, and so is 15.3. Uh, so what we just talked about, the two different ways to calculate the same integral. Uh, we have a theorem here, Fubini's, a much stronger form than the previous section, that says that the area should be, or excuse me, the volume should be the same regardless of the order of integration. And they're very elegant and state this very formally with all of their proper symbols. So I need you to read through this and realize what it means. Um, it does require uh, continuous functions all throughout, and... Uh, um, the gist of Fubini's theorem is that the volume is the same regardless of the order of integration. Okay, so let's try a problem here. And I included all the images that you don't normally get when you're given problems to do just because, you know, when we're doing this for the first time, we need to be able to visualize. And so your goal ultimately is to be able to visualize as much as possible. Okay, so... <clears throat> This says find the volume of the prism whose base is the triangle in the xy plane bounded by the x-axis here and the lines y equals x and x equals 1 whose top lies in the plane here. So the green solid is what we're trying to find the volume of and they're just showing you one particular section of area in that triangle and they're showing you the height. Uh, see how the little extra sticks out? Technically they shouldn't have drawn it that way but we're finding the volumes of all these rectangles infinitesimally um, minimized so that we get an accurate volume. So um, the surface on top is a plane that's tilted downward. So here's the equation of our plane. And so we have to set up the integral and choose the limits of integration. Okay. 
So we need to choose whether we're going to go in the y direction first or in the x direction first. And I'm going to show you how to use a diagram of the region R to help you with that. Technically, you don't need two different diagrams, okay? But they split it out so you could think of vertical separate from horizontal. But we're going to start just setting up our integrals. We're going to put our function in, okay? And let's say we want to integrate with respect to y first. So we'll put dy and then we'll put dx. Now, the thing you need to remember here is the outer limits are always constants, but we can't start by naming those. We have to start by naming the inner limits, okay? So what we've got down here is a vertical line. We're going to look at it in the direction of increasing y. If we're going to integrate with respect to y first, when we travel across this rectangular region vertically, first we hit this value of y. Now this is y equals zero. And as we travel upward, when we leave the region, we leave the region at y equals x. So we're going to travel from y equals zero to y equals x up here. And these are our two function limits um, that describe what y, is, what y value is when it enters the region and what the y value is when it exits the region. Now notice this being a function covers no matter where we draw this arrow, it exits where y equals x. So this covers the whole range of, um, you know, we're getting that area, no matter where we draw that vertical area that we're going to slide across horizontally in a minute, this will cover it. All right, now, with respect to x, secondly, when we do the limits on the second one, realize these must be constant limits. There cannot be... Um, functions here and here, or we won't get a numerical answer, which is the goal to find the volume. So when you go to, to look at the region in the horizontal direction, we don't go from this to this, okay? Um, because we're not starting um, here and only doing this width. We actually need to know the very minimum function of x, or value of x, and the very maximum value of x as we cross this region at its widest point. Okay, so we're going to be going from 0 to 1 in the x direction. So the outside limits are just constants, and you simply have to look at the lowest value and the highest value as you cross the region horizontally. We don't, we don't want to try and insert function values in. Okay, so from there, we could calculate our volume. So we're going to do the interior integral first, okay? With respect to y, we integrate, um, and please carry all the symbols along with you every single time. That's showing proper work, and I insist on that. So now, with respect to y, 3 with respect to y would be 3y. Um, negative x with respect to y would be a constant, so negative xy. Remember, we've got to hold x constant as we do this. And then the derivative of negative y would be negative 1 half y squared all with respect to y here, and we evaluate that from 0 to x. And then bring this symbol along uh, for our next step, dx, excuse me. dx, okay. Now you see, now we're going to plug x in for each y here as we evaluate the definite integral in here. From 0 to 1, always bring that along. Okay, well, since y is the bottom limit, or 0 is the bottom limit for y, we get 0, 0, 0. We won't have to worry about subtracting 0 at the end, so we just have to uh, substitute in x so for y. So 3x is this substitution, and then in for y, negative x times x is negative x squared, and then subbing x in here, x squared times negative 1 half is negative 1 half x squared, and that is complete when we put dx at the end of it. Now we can combine like terms to make this a little simpler. So we're going to have 3x, this is minus 3 over 2x squared dx, and you can put parentheses around your function or not as you like. And now we're going to integrate with respect to x. So now we're doing this part as x goes from 0 to 1. That covers every possible width of this uh, region r. So integrating with respect to x, we're going to have uh, 3x squared over 2. And then here we're going to raise x to the third power and bring the 3 down. So that's going to be negative 1 half x to the third power. And we have to calculate this from 0 to 1. 
again with a zero bottom limit and x in every term. We just have to substitute our 1 and we get 3 over 2. And then when we substitute our 1 in for this x, we get minus a half, which is 2 over 2 or 1. Now, it doesn't matter whether we integrate here with respect to x or y, you should get the same thing, and I'm going to leave that little exercise to you. You might want to try switching this. Now, what I want to do with you before I leave is calculate the limits if we were doing it the other way, and then I'll let you do that integration. Okay, so let's think about how these limits are going to change if we do this in a different direction. Okay, I am going to erase some of this. That's not what I wanted. There we go. Um, the eraser is funny on this thing. Um, clear markers? Does that help? Mm, not sure. Okay, I don't want to lose all of everything, so um, I'll write it up here. So we're going to do it this way instead. We're still going to put 3 minus x minus y. We're just going to uh, integrate with respect to x first and then with respect to y. So that means we're going to look at this picture first. So as I cross x horizontally, first I hit this boundary, which is x equals y. And then I'm going to hit this boundary, which is x equals 1. So, and that's going to be as I leave the boundary of that region, uh, the region of the, um, that's r. So this is going to be from y to 1. Notice this is x equals y and x equals 1. Then we come over and look at the y region. And the lowest region, um, the lowest value of y in this region is 0, and the highest value of y in this region is um, y equals 1. That's the point of intersection of these two lines. So we're going to be going from 0 to 1 for the y coordinates. And this is how we would integrate if we were going to integrate with respect to x first. All right. If you do this for practice, it should come out to 1 just like the first one did. All right, so I don't need my cat to walk on the keyboard while I'm recording. Go behind it. Okay, so why does it matter that we write the order of integration in one order or another? Well, um, sometimes it's just too hard to integrate in a certain order, um, and we need to change it to make it easier. So take a look at this integral. And they've described R here as coincidentally the very exact same region that we just used for the last problem, which is coincidence. Um, but it's easy to evaluate since it has straight edges on the region. So um, it doesn't have to have straight edges, but it is easier when it does. Um, but if you think about, you know, if we set this one up both ways and then decide which way to go, maybe you can see why one would be easier than the other. Okay, if we did with respect to x first, or if we did with respect to y first, um, here we go, okay? So if we're going to do this with respect to x first, we're going to go in the x direction first, so horizontally. So as I travel left or right across this graph, I hit this boundary going in, I hit this boundary going in, and as I exit, I hit this boundary, so I need function values for the inside integral. So this is um, x equals y, and then as I exit, this is x equals 1, just like the last problem. And then when I go vertically, I just need the lowest y and the highest y. The lowest y is 0, the highest y is up here um, at 1, so from 0 to 1. Now this is an accurate representation of a double integral, which when calculated will give you the volume. None of these are values that I'm going to have you do on a calculator ever. I think it's not helpful to know what button to push um, at all. So I always need you to calculate by hand um, on any test or quiz or homework for that matter because um, that being able to punch it into this piece of technology or that piece of technology is not mathematical knowledge. Okay? I also don't want you to spend your time learning how to do it on multiple platforms when you may never use those platforms. Okay. So let's do the limits for the order of integration reverse, doing y first. And by the way, there's no standard order that it must go in. You see a lot of problems with y first and then x, but it's not required. It's just preference and which one you think um, would be easier to actually do the calculation. Okay, if we do y first in the y direction, as we cross this boundary, as we enter it, y right here is 0. 
And as we exit, y equals this function here, x. So we're going from 0 to x, function-wise. When we travel horizontally, we just need the lowest value of x and the highest value of x for the constant limits on the outside. So those are our limits. Which do you think would be easier to integrate? Now I want you to pause this and think about it for real. Okay, I know a lot of you just listened through the pause, but um, think about which one of these am I going to be able to use, um, you know, this is a quotient. Am I going to be able to break this down into smaller function and use integration by parts? Is there a u substitution I can use? Give it a try, okay? So pause it and give that a try and think it through before you hit play again. Okay, come down here. If we integrate with respect to y, and there's no y in the function, then this actually, the first integration is super easy because what we have is um, y times the sine of x divided by x. And that's going to be calculated from 0 to x. Okay, so let's substitute in values here, and we're going to get the integral from 0 to 1. If we plug in x for y, we get x sine x over x, and the x's cancel. So I just get sine of x. If I substitute in 0, I get 0 times sine of x over x, so that's minus 0. And that concludes the calculating the limits. And now we integrate with respect to x. And this is a rather simple integral. We're going to get negative cosine of x. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 1. And so we're going to have negative cosine of 1 uh, minus negative cosine of 0. And please don't make the mistake of thinking cosine of 0 is 0. Um, I don't need to have a 1 there. Negative cosine of 1 minus negative is plus, cosine of 0 is 1. So here is the value of the volume underneath this curve, or this surface rather, uh, and above the xy plane. All right. If you thought about this, you figured out there is no real way to do this by hand. So this one turned out to be much, much better way to go. Okay, uh, moving up. So this is just a cut and paste of uh, a summary of what I just showed you, how to immigrate, um, how to integrate first uh, vertically then horizontally or how to, and how to choose your limits when you do that. The bottom one is horizontal cross sections integrating with respect to x first and then with respect to y. So read this in the book, it's great. It's basically what I taught you how to do. Okay, so when it comes to integration like this that doesn't have constant limits for all integrals, you must, must, must draw a picture of the region. Now, in this problem, they're actually telling you to do the sketch, okay? And I'm saving you from my poor drawing skills on this Wacom tablet by drawing it for you, but I'm going to talk through it so that you know how to draw it, okay? So we're going to look at the inside integral first, integrating with respect to y. So these are going to be y equals, let's say up top it's 2x, the lower limit is y equals x squared, okay? So now we know we need a parabola and we need a straight line, and um, we only need to graph them from x equals 0 to x equals 2. So we graph our line y equals 2x from x equals 0 to x equals 2, and then we graph our parabola from x equals 0 to x equals 2, we find their point of intersection and shade the region between the two curves. So that's how you judge the region of integration. Look and see which variable you're integrating with respect to on the inside and set it equal to the limits. And then to find out um, where to draw them, you choose the limits for the outside variable, which will match the differential on the outside. So that's pretty simple on the sketch part, okay? Now, they want us to write an equivalent integral with the order of inter integration reversed, okay? So they did it um, in the y direction first and then in the x direction. So we're going to go the other order. Okay, so we want um, 4x plus 2, and we want to do dx dy. Okay, so we're going to do this dx first in the horizontal direction. As I cross this region, um, I am going to, and, it, and I should draw that horizontally, that's kind of bad. 
Okay, so I cross this region horizontally. As I enter the region, I'm crossing y equals 2x. And as I exit, I'm crossing um, over y equals x squared. But I need x equals. Here I need x equals something. And that something goes in as the limit. So I need to solve these for x. This is going to be x is the square root of y. And this one's going to be x is y over 2, or 1 half y. So let's think about that differently now. As I cross here, I cross the line, which is going to be y over 2. And when I exit, I cross the parabola, which is going to be the square root of y. So now, when I go to do the y limits on the outside, I just need constant values. The lowest y value for the, uh, for the whole shaded region is 0. The highest y value is 4. So this is going to go from 0 to 4 to complete our changing the order of integration. Now, I'm going to ask you what you think would be the easier um, integral to evaluate. Um, it's a polynomial function, so that's pretty simple, but look at the limits. Um, it's easier when I do the first inside integration with respect to y, and then I have to substitute in x squared and 2x. That's pretty good, and then I'm going to have to integrate x squared and 2x, possibly x cubed. Those I can integrate pretty easily with the power rule. But the moment that I substitute in the square root of y into an expression down here, and now doing the integral of the square root function, that can be challenging. So I really want to avoid this limit if I don't have to do it, and I'd rather calculate it this way. All right? All right, moving on. Okay, as with any other new operation. We need to know its properties. And it's basically true that integrals have the same properties as sums have. Okay, sums like a plus b, adding things together. So the constant rule, if you have a constant on the inside of the integral, you can pull it out and multiply it as a, a coefficient in front of the integral. If you're adding or you're taking the integral, double integral of two functions added together, you could split them apart um, or with subtraction and take the integral separately and then combine them with addition or subtraction. Um, here we need to visualize the volume over the region r and under the function f of x, y is going to be greater than or equal to zero if the function is greater than or equal to zero on the entire region. All right, and conversely, if the function is, well not conversely, but in addition, the volume of f of x, y um, is going to be greater than or equal to the volume of g of x, y if the function f is always greater than the function g on the region r. And then how can we add them? Well, we can add two functions together or we can split them apart, I should say. If we take r and we split it into two regions that do not overlap, that's the key here, okay? And so I have a picture on the next slide to see this. So it's true that you can find the integral of this region um, by splitting them apart, just making sure that these two regions don't overlap. Okay, this is the union symbol, uh, meaning we're combining region 1 and region 2 to get re the, the general region R, um, and the whole key is that they're not overlapping. So those are the properties, and you basically know them already for single integration, so it's not too much of a challenge uh, throwing them in here. All right, last example, and I'm not actually going to calculate this one. You can see the calculation in the textbook, and they even skip some of the steps in the textbook. It's such a complicated mess of fractions, okay? But we want to put it together and do the limits right, okay? So uh, we're going to pretend that I drew this because it is your duty in showing your work for this type of problem to draw the region over which you're integrating as part of the answer to your question. So... Um, let's read this and figure out how we would have known to draw this, okay? So find the volume of the wedge-like solid, okay, they're being kind and telling you the general shape of this solid, that lies beneath the surface z equals 16 minus x squared minus y squared. I would like you to consider, if you can remember what shape this is, this is z, and you could also write it like this, 16 minus x squared plus y squared. So this is an upside-down paraboloid, shifted up above the xy plane 16 units. So it's an upside down bowl that's parabolic in shape, um, in profile anyway. And uh, we want the region of this chunk of it that's over this odd shaped region r, and it's bounded by two curves, this square root function and this straight line. 
So we go to graph these, okay? So you're gonna graph y equals two times the square root of x, and then you're gonna graph y equals four x minus two, and you're gonna find where they intersect, okay? So this point right here tells you some things about the limits you're gonna need here. All right, so let's do our setup. I'm gonna do 16 minus x squared minus y squared. I don't want the parentheses that come in this form to interfere with my calculations. And the next step is to figure out whether we're doing with respect to x first or with respect to y first. And I want you to look at the region now. If I do with respect to y first, and I draw this line upward through here, I'll go right through the heart of the region here, and I'll start at uh, y equals zero, and go up to the square root function. But do I always start at y equals zero? Because if I go vertical here, well, the first time I enter this region is not y equals zero, is it? So I can't do this in one swoop if I do the inside integration with respect to y first, because I don't have y equals zero as the bottom value all the way across the entire region. Let's try it horizontally then. If I draw a horizontal line across this region um, and I start along the square root function, then that's gonna be my lower limit here. And no matter where I, this, this boundary is the same boundary on the left side of this region, no matter where I enter, I'm still gonna be on the square root function. And then when I exit, I'm gonna be on the straight line. So let me say that again so this processes. I can't do vertically first because I'm going up here from y equals zero, zero, but when I start here and go up, I'm starting from y equals two x. And I would have to divide this into two non-overlapping regions if I wanted to do this with respect to y first and then with respect to x, which is totally acceptable. However, it is more work than you really have to do. So this, the idea here is if you're drawing this, this vertical line and you start from a different function on, on part of the region than you do on another region, then you can't do it as one piece. Now, I'd like to do it as one piece if possible, so that's why judging horizontally, no matter where I start from zero to two here, which is my highest value of y, I'm always gonna start, when I enter the region, I'm gonna start at the square root function. And when I exit the region horizontally, I'm always gonna exit at the straight line. So this is gonna be two square roots of x, and this is gonna be two x. There's where I enter and there's where I exit. Now, so that's gonna be um, dy, or excuse me, dx in the x direction, sorry. But this is weird because these are y equals, right? So what did I mess up? I don't wanna leave x in here once I'm done integrating with respect to x, so this is a classic mistake, okay? So I need to take uh, each of my functions and solve them for x because I need the limits in terms of y so that I have a y expression to integrate when I get to the outside integration. So when I solve this, I've gotta square it, okay? And then, so I'm gonna get x is 1 fourth y squared or y squared over four. Uh, when I solve the other, I'm gonna get y plus two over four is x. So, it'll mess up my screen if I try to erase just a piece of it. So this is gonna be x equals y squared over four and y equals y plus two over four. And then with respect to y, the lowest y value is zero, the highest y value is two. And that will get my outside limits. Okay, so the other direction, dy dx, did not work with a single region. I would have to set, up, set it up as two. So if I asked you to set it up the other way, you would have to actually give me this part as one integral, and you'd have to give me this part as a second integral if I asked you to set it up both ways. Okay, um, but since this is less work and they didn't ask for both ways, I would try it this way. And even this way, because of these very involved limits, you can have a, um, a long time dealing with um, lots of fractions and um, just take a peek at the book. They even skip steps, so it's kind of funny. All right, that is lesson 15.2. Thank you so much for listening.